What will the public uh, find in Vikings Valhalla? I think the public will find all the elements that they loved from the previous show, but they will also find uh, a greater sense of machination and thriller writing. I think that's what Jeb has set out to create in this world, is one that grows, twists, turns, and keeps your suspense in tow. It's not simply an action epic it's not just vikings and boats and swords and bloods it's a, a multifaceted thriller that will keep you guessing right until the end of season one and then some well i i would say um that what makes our series so so special is um that we have so many interesting strong and you don't mention the characters it's so much about their own path like decisions they make for their lives, their spirituality, the emotions, and um, they're also like amazing, like drama and fight scenes and action and all that. But um, our characters have both, and I think that makes it special. Well, what they'll find is a very exciting story about people who've got some uh, some sinister goals. We've got, uh, I mean, we've got great scripts written by uh, Jeb Stewart, who obviously wrote uh, Die Hard, so he knows what he's doing. They're real page turners, and it's a gripping tale set in the Viking era. And if you're looking for that sort of stuff, uh, this is the show for you. They will find a show that's full of um, Vikings, uh, and also in some parts Saxons, um, because as you um, may already know, the uh, the show uh, is set a hundred years after um, the original Vikings show. Although uh, having said that, you don't have to have watched any of the Vikings show to uh, to to be able to enjoy Vikings Valhalla. Um, uh, but you'll find. Uh, a new and fresh uh, set of Viking characters who are mostly out for either revenge, uh, power, um, sex, uh, or a combination of those things. They will find an incredible story um, that transcends time about love, about beliefs, about power, about adventure, about family, and it's set in this incredibly breaking point of paganism is on the way out and Christianity is coming in. And it's a world that's constantly changing. So you're going to be thrust into these people's lives and be taken on a very exciting journey with them. Mm. You, I couldn't have said that better. It's beautiful. It's beautiful what she said. And also there, the, the, the power of the women in this series, I think, is quite amazing if i might say so myself and also the partnership of uh, freydis and uh, estrid jalhokan is uh, very unique and their beliefs and their sort of strength together so that's that's something you can uh, also look forward to i think they're going to find a little bit of everything they're going to have huge ac action sequences that that they come to expect epic battles um but at the same time as political intrigue, there's romance. It's a show that's very well-rounded in, in what it gives the viewers. And and yeah, I, I hope they really enjoy it. I hope that the audience uh, receive some beautiful entertainment, uh, some education and some elevation um, that are some, uh, an inspiration. So how do you define uh, your own characters? I tend to go to the childhood of my characters when I when I first start uh, diving into research. And I spent a bit of time, uh, about a week or so, in a little cabin just away from uh, uh, society for a while and just really dived into, you know, what it might be like to, you know, grow up in the harsh environments of Greenland and grow up in a household in which your father is notoriously one of the most violent Vikings. And then, um, and also the family dynamics and relationships there um, and how that 
just simply looking after one another and looking after the people you love transfers into the greater Viking world, which is so new to him. And so that was that was very much my line of research. I think I'd define him as a headstrong, ambitious young prince who's who's got his heart set on becoming a king. And things are quite simple in, in that regard. But over the course of the series, things become things become complicated and life gets in the way. And I think what he discovers is that to, to become a man, to, to become the kind of man that he wants to be, he's going to have to make some, some tough life choices. And to Sam's point of how I found that, yeah, diving into the research was very useful, the historical record, because this is a character who existed in, in real life. But also not getting too bogged down in that because I wanted to leave room to let my interpretation flourish. Well, I would define him as a naughty boy. He's a naughty little boy and he needs to be he needs to be put in his place. But no one is putting him in his place. He just gets to run amok. And he has really interesting um, connections and uh, uh, sort of, uh, what do you call it, clashes with the other characters in the show, and which is hopefully entertaining for the, for the people to watch. Yeah, it was an absolute, you know, it's an absolute joy, isn't it, to be able to step into a show uh, like Vikings Valhalla, um, it's such a, a large scale production and to be able to play somebody with such authority and power, you know, it's an absolute privilege to be able to uh, have that kind of power um, uh, in the show and, and to dominate, um, you know, a couple of hundred extras per day and they have to, you know, do whatever I tell them to is just amazing. He's a survivor. I think it's that simple. Um, he gets himself out of a lot of scrapes and manages to turn the worst things that could be happening him to his advantage. And yeah, he comes out smelling of roses most of the time. I think Emma is a born queen. She came from a royal household, um, uh, had a like um, had a mother who was kind of a role model, a role model for her because she was also an important advisor to her husband and her father. And I think um, Emma, when she, when she came to England, she knew that she was special and in, that she um, would do anything for the crown that is necessary. And she's very, um, she's intelligent. Uh, she is. She's, she's a good strategist um, and she's also a loving mother at the same time. And um, and yeah, that's what really fascinates me about. She has a lot of potential. Well, Freydis is uh, this, I find her to be incredibly complex and very straightforward at the same time. I feel like I share a lot of my personal traits with her. Freydis is uh, incredibly headstrong, very fiery, uh, impulsive person who is very driven by her emotions. Um, she is a fierce believer in, in the old gods. That's, you know, all she knows, that's what she grew up with. And she is, she's very loyal, you know, and she's very true to what she believes in a way that she's almost, she's almost radicalized in her beliefs that when she enters the story, when we meet her for the first time, it's, it's very black and white. And thanks, you know, to the help and wisdom of Jarl Hokan, she starts to paint the world in a little bit more color. She's not a young woman. She's seen it all. She's traveled, she's raided. She's been a strong leader from that area in uh, Scandinavia. But now when we come into the story, change is happening, right? And as Frida said before, we sort of paganism, it's on its way out. Christianity is on its way in. There's a lot of stuff happening, going on. And she's trying to, 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 to uh, greet these changes in a way that might be difficult because she's striving for peace, but too much is going on. So uh, uh, I, I, I feel that, but the, the beliefs that she has also is a, such a strong drive in her character also. Uh, so she is cool, calm and collected and uh, very strong. You both played two very empowered women. And mm -hmm. how do you see the change in female representation on TV? I think we've come a long way. There's still, you know, plenty of, you know, ground to cover. Um, 
But for me to discover that, you know, Freitas and her, you know, trauma is really what drives the story in the first beginning of the season. To me, that that felt like, yeah, we, we've come away, you know. It's about a woman driving the story forward with her desire for revenge. And that was incredible. But also something that me and Caroline have both talked about a lot is how rare it is to have these two strong female characters who are together. They're not, you know, working against each other. It's not a story about her or her. But you have these two women who are empowering each other, who are nurturing who are learning from each other and who are really supporting each other and then throw in all the shield maidens on top of that. It's uh, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, we had days when we were, you know, 12 plus Viking clad shield maiden women fighting each other. And I don't feel like you see that very often. So <laughs> no, that's pretty amazing and unique. And also because they, they have this strong cause together, which is, it's not about sort of, it's not about a man or even family. It's about something much bigger, much larger than life. It's about their beliefs. It's about paganism. It's about exploring inside. It's it's about life, you know, and in future generations. And uh, to have that, you know, companion and partnership together in a movie, that's very, that's very uh, unique and uh, very special. What was the best and the worst things of the Vikings filming? I mean, obviously the COVID of it all was particularly hard for season one, working behind masks and social distancing. Um, it a, made it hard and scary, but also took away a lot of the fun, which filming is usually. Um, so that was very sad. And then the best thing was the fact that we were working because a lot of people in the entertainment industry were not. Um, but I think it's a thing that a lot of people have been asking about is, is how do you work in the shadow of a show that was so successful as Vikings was? And I think that meant that nobody in the cast or crew dropped their guard at any time. They were aware of legacy um, and the fan base. And so there was a responsibility to A, please them, to B, keep them watching, but not at the cost of bringing in a whole new swathe of Viking fans. Um, and that wasn't just Netflix and MGM and Jeb as the writer who were worried about that. I think the costume designers, the set designers, the stunt choreographers, the actors, all of us were aware every single turn of, of making this legacy live longer than it has already. And I personally think we've succeeded. So I'm very happy. Well, I think I agree with David when it comes to um, the least favorite part of uh, making this production was COVID, like filming during COVID. That was that was really sad and was hard. But at the same time, it brought us closer together, which is which was which is the best part. Um, like the best part was the company, um, all these amazing cast members, crew members that we spend so much time with. I think I enjoyed this the most. Oh, the best, the best things about the Vikings filming would be the, the crew because the, the Irish crew we had are so good at what they do. And the, you, you just feel that you're in safe and good, uh, com what's it, competent hands, which is a good feeling. Uh, and the worst would be, I don't know, I mean, it wasn't really bad days. The worst would be, you know, pissing rain. Which isn't that bad. I really enjoyed. I I absolutely adore being uh, being with the horses. That was just such a privilege, you know, just to spend your working day in and around horses. And uh, you know, I, I've I've ridden a fair amount of my time. And you know, as you know, all horses are sort of different, and you get to know the different personalities. And um, that was just. A, I just find it a great jo great joy, really, when when your working day is in and around horses it's um that that was my favorite thing i think i'm worst but there are no bad points are there you're doing a show uh called vikings valhalla for netflix there's 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 only good yeah that's true i mean even the rain wasn't that bad it was kind of nice. it rains anyway you know you'd be yeah. you'd rather be you'd rather be doing a show called vikings valhalla in the rain than unemployed in the rain you know there's there's those two things <laughs> yes so uh, a few years ago, uh, TV don't, don't have the same global reach as it does now. 
and knowing that the whole planet is going to see you, uh, how do you leave the fact of staring in a series of Netflix? I attempt not to think about that at all. Um, it, um, I just woke up this morning in LA and I saw outside my window a billboard of the three, the three of us, myself, Frida and Leo. And I find that quite overwhelming. And so I try to remain as close to my family and my friends who keep me grounded. And uh, uh, yeah, I tend not to think about that though. Um, it, it is an honor and a gift to be able to tell these stories and to share it with the world. And I don't take that for granted. Yeah, I echo what Sam is saying that it's fairly daunting and it sort of doesn't bear thinking about how many people out there will watch. It's hard to comprehend these numbers and even sort of put them into any sort of perspective. But the fact that the show has such a global audience backing it already, which is thanks to the amazing work of the previous series and, and all, the, all the work that they've done is, is something very special. And um, special, but a little scary. A nice combination. Uh, you both are working in TV from uh, almost 20 years. And how do you see the change that has occurred in television industry in, in all these years? Well, the change has mainly been that TV has gotten... Uh, much more is being produced now and at a... Uh, higher quality level i believe i mean you you see it back in the day you would have film actors they wouldn't really do tv but now there's no hesitation from a-list hollywood film actors to step into television that's because the the quality has has risen and is uh, yeah is is uh, a lot higher than it used to be right bradley am i wrong yeah so i was agreeing with johannes saying that it's just the, the quality of the productions have risen so so much and it amazes me how um, streaming channels like Netflix um, are able to produce so much high quality content um, and I was uh, you know I live here in, in Cardiff in Wales and the, the amount of, of production that goes around goes on uh, around here um, is just phenomenal you know there's so much content being produced and it is all now has to be of such a high quality because people demand a high quality um, which is great news all around really I, I went on the record at, I think it was the Brussels International Film Festival, Fantastic Film Festival about this a few years ago, um, about the emergence of streamers um, like Netflix and, and other, other companies. I've, I'm stunned by the shift in power and focus that it has. And as a result of it, the, the huge bloom in content and opportunity um, And I think it's, 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 it's a double-edged sword. I think what it does in one side is it gives some shows a chance to emerge and be fantastic that wouldn't have normally had a chance. But it also means that alongside the great things, there are some things that are maybe not quite so great as they used to be. Um, so far, I think everyone is benefiting from it. The industry is benefiting from the huge amount of work. Viewers are benefiting from a huge amount of television to watch. And that can only be a good thing. Um, as long as we just keep our focus on making sure that the stuff that is made is as good as it can be. The scripts are as tightly nailed down as they possibly can be. And the actors learn their lines. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Julio, uh, you uh, stay in a uh, previous series for Netflix. I think it's The Liberator. How was that experience? Yeah. It was the Liberator, and and that was um, the showrunner for that was Jeb Stewart, who was also the showrunner for Valhalla. So there was a nice thread there. But I was actually I was working on another period drama at the time, so it was a it was a short stint. Um, I was a, a an American soldier, and I, yeah, I spent a few days in Poland doing that, and then I went back to being a, a Regency period architect so so it was a it was fun to dip my toes in like that and then obviously this has been a much bigger bigger venture and to feel feel the the infrastructure that comes with such a big production company like netflix backing a show is is very very special and it is an honor so uh, for you frida uh, you participated in the witcher i think in yes. one yeah and The, do you prefer to repeat with Henry Cavill or continue surrounded by your Vikings? 
<laughs> well, let me say that Henry Cavill was absolutely a joy to work with. It was my first time doing a big international show. I got to play his mother, which is incredible. He's a very generous person. And to be able to witness a number one on the call sheet and see how he interacted with the cast and with the crew. And, you know, I came in and I had such a small part. It was a huge inspiration for me. And I'm I'm very thankful to have seen that, you know, opportunity. Um, it's it's a way I would like to carry myself. And I hope that people that work on our show feel that that's, you know, a legacy I carry forward. Um, but Freitas is Freitas, you know, she will live with me for the rest of my life. and. I would take her any day over any character. I really would. <laughs> and you, Sam, uh, you was uh, Taliban in Sabrina. So I, I think it's, you know, Sabrina is one of my favorite TV, movie, TV series from last year. So how, how do you feel uh, to work in a series like Sabrina and now in a series like like? Yeah, I mean, Sabrina was so fun to work on. The um, the cast were incredible and I felt so welcomed into that family. I think, um, It's very fantastical and very. Um, uh, it was cool to uh, to play the Prince of Hell. But uh, in this in this series, you know, I get to be part of the inception of it. Um, one of the you know, original cast members with myself, Leo and Frida, and um, uh, it's it's very very different. A lot more, um, I suppose, authentic and grounded and 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 drama based. And so it was like. Um, It was cool to, you know, shift into a, a different place. I, I suppose. And you, Caroline, uh, you participated in a Spanish film years ago in seven, I think. Yeah. Call it Tuya Siempre uh, from yeah. Manuel Lombardo. Uh, how was the experience in Barcelona? Oh, it was wonderful. It was absolutely amazing. Love the food. Mm. <laughs> that was great. No, it was a, it's a, a, that was like very different from this, of course, because this is so big. It's so, I mean, it has like a volume that you've never, this production, of course. And this was like a, a smaller Spanish movie. But I mean, I enjoyed Barcelona. I enjoyed so much portraying this woman. And also semi, semi, uh, a real story, I believe, this Tuya Simple. So, uh, That was a great time in my life. And David, I'm seeing uh, behind you a poster of uh, Cold Skin. I had a question prepared about that. <laughs> It's the mm -hmm. Please. Fun film. Uh, can you tell something about your experience in, in that film? There's a reason why that poster is on my study wall. Um, second, obviously, to Vikings Valhalla. It was the greatest filming experience of my career. Um, We spent five months, uh, oh, sorry, five weeks filming in Madrid. Um, and I've never been anywhere other than an island of filming Vikings Valhalla where people welcomed us with such warmth and open arms. It was absolutely glorious. Um, and on a side note, to be out there as an Englishman shooting an infamous Catalan text with a French director at the time when Brexit came in, I felt like I betrayed the entire shoot and that I, I was basically a persona non grata from that point onwards. Now, I, I loved making Cold Skin on the Peel Trio. I, I think it was one of the happiest experiences of my on-screen career. I really do. Savio is a great director and it's a great name. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it was wonderful. And that's why it's up there. It is our blood! Viking Blood!